a couple of major studies have now established a role for ibrutinib in patients with previously treated chronic lymphocytic leukemia, small lymphocytic lymphoma. One of those studies is called Helios, and we're here to talk about a new analysis of the management of adverse events in this trial. And I am with uh, Dr. Asher Albin Shanankan, who is Chair of Hematology and Oncology at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. Let's go back for a moment and just remind us about the Helios trial and what it found originally. Absolutely. The Helios study is one of the largest randomized placebo-controlled phase three study, the first one uh, for ibrutinib. And this study was designed to uh, see if addition of ibrutinib to bendamustine and rituxan chemotherapy adds an advantage in terms of progression-free survival, which was its primary endpoint. So patients receive BR either with ibrutinib or with placebo uh, and completed six cycles and thereafter they were maintained on either one of them, placebo or ibrutinib, until disease progression or an unacceptable toxicity. The primary endpoint, as I mentioned, was progression-free survival and this endpoint was met at a median of 17 months, demonstrating that patients who received ibrutinib had an 80% reduction in risk of progression or death. And this is a landmark study demonstrating, uh, again, the significant benefit that ibrutinib therapy has brought to patients with CLL. Now, what you're talking about here at the ASH meeting on hematologic malignancies is some of the safety data, correct? That is correct. Uh, ibrutinib has already demonstrated uh, in various other clinical trials, very safe drug, not too many grade three or four side effects. Um, but this is a very unique situation in the Helios trial because of the placebo control. We're able to have a very unique perspective, an unbiased perspective of the toxicities established or associated with the brutinib can be further validated and assessed. In this particular analysis, which is the first of its kind uh, reported for this study, uh, we look at the known and adverse events that are associated or recorded and see what uh, we can learn from them. So what did you find? So first we were able to see that in general the toxicity profile was very much similar in the two arms. Um, for example, neutropenia was more or less the same and is more related to the bendamustine rituxan regimen as one would expect. Right. There were some unique aspects that we were uh, able to validate for uh, ibrutinib, such as um, diarrhea. There was a higher incidence of diarrhea, about 10% more, and but it was all grade one and very self-resolving and for short duration. We also noted a little bit more thrombocytopenia. We noted that actually the patients who received ibrutinib had lesser degree of anemia. Uh, and that may reflect um, a more robust response uh, to disease uh, in response to this drug. So that was also very encouraging. Now there are some unique aspects that impact clinical practice. For example, atrial fibrillation. Yeah, that was what I was going yes, to Yes, uh, this is a very important side effect that has been previously noted and associated with ibrutinib. So the question in the clinic is what do you do with it if patients are at risk for atrial fibrillation, or they already have it, should these patients be, um, the uh, uh, they should not get it, or what do we do about it? So we looked at a very, in a very unbiased, again, manner, looking at, we first found that the atrial fibrillation rate was very low. Uh, and the difference between the two arms was only 5%. So there is a, certainly a, uh, 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 the, the, the toxicity of atrial fibrillation does exist, but none of the patients required uh, dose, dose reduction or so forth. A few patients re required dose interruption for about seven days or so forth. And only about 1.4% of the patients actually stopped treatment for atrial fibrillation. We looked at various risk factors, abnormal AKG, prior history of uh, atrial fibrillation and so forth, and we concluded that there was no one unique risk factor that one could um, pin down that would predict atrial fibrillation as a side effect to brutinib. And uh, therefore we concluded that patients who have uh, rhythm dysfunctions or cardiac comorbidities um, should be given a brutinib and should not shy away uh, from this therapy.
And that's because we, when we analyze the progression-free survival, independent of cardiac comorbidities, the outcome was the same in the two arms. And they should remain on whatever antiplatelet or anticoagulant therapy they are on in the first place. That's a very important question. There have been reports in the past that it, does ibrutinib cause more bleeding? Right. And so we looked at, and should, should ibrutinib be given in concurrently with antiplatelet therapies? Now remember, this is a disease in the elderly population. They, have, right. uh, they use aspirin or they may be on other anticoagulations right. for various reasons. And we found that 40% of the patients in the ibrutinib arm were on some kind of an anticoagulant or an antiplatelet agent. And the overall incidence of um, bleeding associated with ibrutinib was 30%. But most of that bleeding was bruises and contusions. Um, there were two patients who discontinued therapy for, um, for reasons of bleeding. And uh, by and large, we were able to conclude that uh, patients who are on stable anticoagulation or antiplatelets um, should not be uh, restricted or is, it's not a contraindication to use uh, ibrutinib therapy. And again, we did the progression-free survival analysis on them and we found that no matter what your uh, uh, outcome is in terms of bleeding, the, the progression-free survival benefit was the same with ibrutinib and the two arms behaved very, uh, very appropriately in the way we predicted. Our conclusion from this analysis today that was presented showed that the, the dogma that if somebody is an anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy may have a higher risk of bleeding, uh, at least in this particular trial, does not pan out to be correct. These patients do benefit from CLL therapy with the brutinib, should be offered that because it's, it's a therapy for their, for their leukemia and that there's no increased risk of bleeding uh, with the brutinib. Uh, two patients did die, but they have very specific problems that would have pre predisposed them for such an event. And that's also uh, discussed in the presentation. So what's your bottom line message? What I would like to emphasize is if you have a patient who has atrial fibrillation, is stable, is not decompensated, a brut that's not a contraindication to use the brutinib for their CLL therapy as long as they're an appropriate candidate for that. My second thing is if patients are on any, any anticoagulant or antiplatelet therapy and require, and they're stable, they're monitored, and they require a brutinib therapy for their CLL, their CLL should be treated first with this drug and that the risk is not um, significant in terms of major hemorrhages and bleeding. Uh, bruises and contusions will happen, but you should monitor them as they go through and interrupt dose interruption or dose reduction is not necessarily needed. So does this wrap Helios or is it ongoing? Definitely. Is it ongoing? The Helios trial is completed and, you know, it's going to be presented as a full uh, manuscript very soon. And we presented it at ASCO earlier this year. So, yes, it is. Yeah, fantastic news for patients. Yeah, and, absolutely. Well, we have a lot of news from this meeting that we would like to share with you, so please look around for our interviews that are online and also in Ash Clinical News. I'm Rick McGuire.